We are on air. Oh, we're on air. Hooray. I've got the new, testing the new, we're not saying what, this camera is just a, a unnamed new camera. Okay. This is a, a, a fancy new camera that shall rena- remain unnamed. Yes, yeah, so someone has sent me a camera to test. So the question is, is this better? I'm looking up here. I uh, can I, see into your soul. Yes, you can. I put it up on my, uh, on my, I just, like, Oh, you'll be able to... Could we do dual dramatic zoom-outs at the end? We can do dual dramatic zoom-outs. Okay, this is going to be epic. For no other reason than we can do that at the end of it. That. Okay, scandalous. Cool. So, let's see what's going on. You're right, I should have hit publish now. Instead, One guy's like, is this a Dewey versus Truman thing? That's an obscure reference. I don't get that reference. Uh... They uh, when Tru- when when Dewey and Tru- uh, Harry Truman ran for president, mm-hmm. when Dewey was running against him, they printed two mag- they printed two copies of the newspaper. One that said Truman wins. Yeah. Yep. That says Dewey wins. So there's a great picture of Truman holding ah. a newspaper saying the other guy won. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I guess we should like talk to folks. <laughs> right. Some guys like, can you IM? I'm like, um, no. no. Hello, it's the ASP.net community stand up. Uh, we've got uh, myself uh, testing out a new camera and uh, speakerphone. Here's the new speakerphone. And uh, John Galloway is here. Very excited. Yes. With, a, with an off centered uh, video view there and a picture I of. I am, I'm framing. An Abe Lincoln Beerstein on his. Uh, it is. Yeah. Very exciting. And uh, Damien is testing. What do you do? John loves community. Damien is is it clearly jet lagged and drunk? <laughs> and that's just so I don't forget, because John gets upset when we don't, don't do the community. John, so John doesn't cry. Why that's don't true. we uh, have John? Uh, and drunk is a relative term. Do community now. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, right. Hopefully, okay. Can you see this? Yes. Excellent. Okay. I'll run through them fast. I know you have exciting things to show. Um, Tuberk doing great things with Nginx and, and Docker Compose. This is a really cool post. Um, so there's that. Uh, this is Dominic Beyer uh, talking about identity server for ASP.NET 5 and .NET Core. Uh, so announcing the new, uh, this is identity server 4, I believe. So that's exciting. Um, the workshops, Damien, these are from your uh, NDC London. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so exciting stuff. These are all the workshops there. Um, uh, so this was something that uh, David Fowler retweeted uh, this, or tweeted about. This is uh, a question on Stack Overflow asking about the differences between the feeds, the CI dev and vNext and... Um, so Victor wrote up a very nice Stack Overflow answer here, explaining what's what's in each feed and what they're used for. Oh, so, wow, that's cool. Yeah, good stuff. Um, Philip writing about reusing external view components in ASP.NET 5 and MVC 6. So starting to see some some cool um, posts about uh, view components in general. I got another one on that, but um, so Philip always great stuff from him. Uh, Ugo, uh, a post on using Kestrel with ASP.NET 5. What I like about this post is he, you know, he explains kind of the basics, but then he goes into things like um, adding a certificate and serving up a site using HTTPS. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, so that's kind of cool. Uh, Mike, uh, talking about, um, this is kind of a, a quick post, but a nice post on ASP.NET 5 configuration in startup. Um, so kind of a nice introduction to that. Uh, Robert talking about embedded resources in Web API. Um, so, talking about how to embed those resources. Uh, that's that's the like the current Web API. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. All right, so we'll just. Uh, but technically, this is the ASP.NET. Well, very, very cool. <laughs> I just wanted to make just wanted to make sure that was clear. Good point. Yeah, that is true. Deeply useful, though, to be clear. Yep. 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 Uh, Armin, I pointed out one of his posts recently. Uh, here he's digging into on, um, uh, different uh, DI options, scope dependencies in this case. So he's talking about different DI uh, options. 
Um, I mentioned view components. This is David Paquette uh, talking about, um, you know, introducing view components. Mm -hmm. um, here is Mike Brind, um, he, and he's talking about session state using MVC uh, 6, uh, setting that up with SQL Server. And finally, we've got uh, Damien Bod, and he's got some cool experiments with uh, Entity Framework 7 and MVC 6. So talking about things, here he goes into Onion architecture, he talks about migrations. So a lot of kind of like, you know, 201, 301 kind of um, things with EF7 and ASP.NET. And Sweet. I'm, I am done. So yeah, a lot of good stuff. Let me stop my sharing. Fabulous. Fabulous. I'm looking at the responses on Twitter here. Mm -hmm. So what's your announcement, Damien? So we got some feedback over the past year. I think it's fair to say. A little bit of feedback, which did align with some um, feelings that we had internally, um, that these things are never going to feel this way. What's that? You are not the only ones to feel this way. You are not the only ones to feel this way, yes. The, the, we, shared the, the, we shared large parts of this feedback, and I'm, of course, referring to the fact that we called this wondrous new thing ASP.NET 5, which did create um, probably the wrong impression about a number of aspects of the work that we're doing. Um, and so we have been working long and hard with all the powers that be to come up with you know, maybe a, a better strategy. What can we do to make this a little clearer? And so we are changing the name of what we're building. And so I think you just pushed publish on the blog post, so it's not going to be too much of a surprise. We did look at a whole bunch of names, and we went as far, you know, we looked at all types of crazy ideas, as far left field as you can think, or, and we eventually came back to something that um, we are that we've already talked about in the in the context of other things, so we're going to call it ASP.NET Core, and it's going to be 1.0. And so this, I think, better represents that what we're doing here is a new framework. It's a new web stack from the ground up that's trying to solve different problems um, sometimes to, to the existing uh, framework that we've had now for about 15 years. It is a 1.0. Like, everything has been rewritten from the ground up, and this at this point now, all the way down, so we even have a new .NET. We're running on now on .NET Core, which will also be reversioned back to .NET Core 1. We had been calling it .NET Core 5 in some of the material, which I think was a little confusing because, you know, 5 is bigger than 4, which is the current .NET version, and it was just wrong to say that this was number 5. So we have .NET Core 1, and then on top of that we have ASP.NET Core 1, and conversely, we all the things that you associate with ASP.NET 5, like the subsystems, will be reversion underneath this as well. So this isn't just a change of name. This affects everything. So the package names in NuGet will change. There'll be Microsoft.ASP.NETCore.MVC, and that will be version 1. Um, the namespaces and the APIs you use will change. Similarly, Microsoft.ASP.NETCore.MVC. And by changing it everywhere, um, it will make it much clearer what um, stack you're using, whether you're using ASP.NET Core or whether you're using uh, you know, ASP.NET as it's existed up until now and will continue to exist uh, for a long time. And so it looks like Han uh, Hanselman's world crashed, and so we will expect him to come back in <laughs> at some point. Um, so I'm seeing some... And so you can expect this to take place starting now, um, the engineering team was holding off on making any actual changes in GitHub until this announcement went out. So the announcement went out live. I've done it here. It's on the blog. Uh, it's on Hanselman's blog post, and it's also being cross-posted to the ASP.NET team blog, um, letting him know that we're still going. Um, so, yeah, so that is it. We are now ASP.NET Core 1.0, and uh, hopefully you'll start seeing the effects of that change flowing through, you know, GitHub and all those things uh, very, very soon. That will uh, hopefully be done by the end of this week. So if you're looking at the source code repos, you're using our nightly builds off MyGet, um, then uh, you'll be able to uh, see those things, uh, yeah, pretty soon. So hopefully that works for people. John, could you share your screen? My, I tried to share my screen and it crashed everything. You want me to share my screen? And put my blog post up, because I made it, and I want to show Damien. 
All right, let's do this. This one here? Yes, so scroll down, my friend. To and that? Zoom in, on, zoom in on that right there. All right. So that's the stack that Damien described. Can we just can we pin John to broadcast? Because it's I flipping did. back to you when you talk. I, I did pin him to broadcast. Oh, I'm seeing you. Okay, no idea why. I'm ninety percent sure that it's it's showing him. I'll just click him. There we go. Okay. So there's John, and we've got ASP.NET 4.6, which is RTM'd, runs on .NET Framework 4.6, and then ASP.NET Core 1.0 is open source, not yet released going into RC2. The name will be Core 1 when RC2 comes out? Yep. Cool. And that sits on top of .NET Core 1.0 and the libraries that come with it. And you can see what's open source and what's RTM right now. That's all up on my blog right now. And then it's also cross-posted at the web dev blog. So if you yep. don't like me or my blog, uh, cover, uh, take a look at uh, the web dev blog. And as the diagram there shows, so we will, we're continuing to support running ASP.NET Core 1 on .NET Framework um, as well as .NET Core 1.0, so they don't line up exactly um, So because we wanted the new framework to continue to work on top of the existing sort of Windows-based .NET framework. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, so there's that. But, so, I mean, you can think of Core as basically meaning it's new, it's open source, it's cross-platform, it's the thing that, you know, represents everything from the ground up being rebuilt um, and redesigned for this new world. Um, similarly, .NET Core as a concept and as a name probably has lost a little meaning for a lot of people because it's sort of, I, I think if you ask someone what .NET Core is, you ask five people, you'll get five different answers. I put a slide together for NDC, one of the talks I gave, which um, I try to use to explain to people, I think, for me, it makes sense about what .NET Core is. The way to think about .NET Core is that it's more than one thing, um, but effectively there are four main components to what we're calling .NET Core. There is Core FX, which is effectively the new BCL. So Core FX are the libraries, system.star. These are the things that you reference in your application to write .NET code. Okay, so Core FX, and again, Core FX, those libraries work on .NET Core and .NET Framework. Okay, so you can use those and when they're used in UWP apps, for example, as well. Um, there is Core CLR, which is the new CLR, which is cross-platform, Linux, you know, Mac, Windows, has its roots in the Silverlight um, CLR basis, um, has some behavior differences from the full CLR that runs on .NET Framework on Windows, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got Core FX, Core CLR. We have Core RT, and there's a, you know, you can see a, a, uh, a repeating theme here with the name, CoreFX, CoreCLR, CoreRT. CoreRT is the native runtime that is part of the new .NET native stack, uh, which was announced in November as well, that is part of and will be surfaced through the last component, which is the CLI, okay, the command line interface, which you blogged about, I think, just last week, Scott, or the week before. Yep, yep. So that's the .NET Core CLI, which is a new cross-platform command line experience for building .NET Core applications. And that's just the phrasing we use. There's that word .NET Core again, that phrase. But again, the .NET CLI or the .NET Core CLI supports building class libraries and indeed console applications and thus ASP.NET Core applications that run on full framework, okay? It's just that ASP.NET, uh, the .NET Core CLI doesn't build necessarily MS build based projects, it builds project JSON based projects. So when you think of project JSON today, that was previously a DNX concept, and then it became a UWP NuGet concept, now because it's supported in the UWP apps. Project JSON apps as a project model are a .NET CLI concept, okay? And so you'll be able to build a class library, you'll be able to build an ASP.NET Core app, and you'll be able to build a .NET console app um, using Project JSON and the .NET Core CLI, and if you're in Visual Studio, the project system you'll use will be Xproj, which was the project system we built for DNX, okay? And that, that is being reappropriated uh, for the .NET Core world and indeed the .NET Core CLI. So .NET Core is really those four things, Core FX, Core CLR, Core RT, and the CLI, and then ASP.NET Core builds on top of that um, and also runs on .NET Framework. 
as a result of this thing. So hopefully this uh, realignment of these names uh, will clear some things up for people and hopefully it'll be easier to talk about what we're doing what does, there? It mean, what does it mean to MVC as far as like MV6, MVC6? So those numbers yeah, go. So, so subsystems will also reset. So now it'll be Microsoft.ASP.NET Core.MVC and the new get package version will be one. And so um, you would, I guess if you're going to do the full name, it would be ASP.NET Core 1.0 MVC. Okay, but it's not like MVC six on core one on no. frameworks four point seven all that kind of stuff. No, the package, the package version, all the packages are going to be reset to one zero and to have ASP.NET Core. So ASP.NET, no, ASP.NET Core is our product name, I guess is the way. ASP.NET is a brand as right. much as a product name. Uh, ASP.NET Core is this product that we're building, which was previously ASP.NET five, right. and ASP.NET Core has MVC, it has middleware, it will have, there will be a version of SignalR for it. Uh, at mm -hmm. some point, we will do, uh, you know, there's web API features, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. And someone is asking here uh, the monikers, the internal monikers for people who make frameworks. Uh, it went from DNX Core 50 to .NET. Yep. It's going to be net standard, right? Net standard yep. is the way forward, correct? Yep, so as part of RC2, um, and again, you could probably, you could, you could choose to make net standard also part of uh, what we're calling .NET Core, but that's kind of out to the side. Um, is this concept of the .NET platform standard and the .NET standard library, which are two orthogonal you know, but related uh, items. And we'll have more uh, useful uh, descriptions about those soon. You can see the talk that David and I gave at the MVP Summit uh, late last year. It's up on Channel 9. And the talk we gave at NDC London last week will be up on the web in a few weeks from now, which uh, might help there as well. And obviously, docs will come along soon. But yes, the new thing that you'll target as a class library author, if you want your .NET code to run on .NET platforms around the world, will be the .NET standard or you know, .NET standard for the um, for the TFM if you're a class library. And if you're an app, it'll be .NET standard app, which and is effectively sorry. Everything gets better now. Like it all. I up. hope so. I think, I mean, more more things line up now. Like, I think you'll see more of the names align with other parts of the stack, and where we use one name to mean one thing, hopefully it's being used, a similar name is being used to mean a similar but related thing elsewhere. And so uh, things, I think, should uh, better line up now as we move forward. We can't fix everything. Like, you know, things like some version numbers in the system dot packages are there for a reason, and um, changing those is a little more impactful, so we have to you know, to sort of work within the frame that, framework that we have, um, but I think this is a, I think this is the right change. I think this is a good change. So, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just. This is all inter, you know, internal. I'm looking at all the different things that are flowing in right now. Yeah, I'm looking at Twitter. I'm looking up here. I'm trying to. Uh, on, on my blog right now, already six comments. This is great news. Much clearer. Much better. Much easier to explain. One step perfect, one step cl closer. They would like Semver. <laughs> one guy says he wants Semver 1.0.0. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, we're going to be following mm -hmm. Semver to the best of our ability, uh, whether or not we call it Core 1 or Core 1.0 or Core 1.0.0 or whatever. I don't think really Well, matters. yeah, I think, I mean, to, be, to complete, be completely practical, I think a version number on a product name like ASP.NET mm -hmm. Core 1.0 is less meaningful. It's much more meaningful on the packages themselves. Mm -hmm. um, like the number on the big, the big name ASP.NET Core is more of a marketing thing, frankly. I mean, this is version one of ASP.NET Core. I have no idea what version two will look like or what it will be. I don't think it'll be for quite some time yet. Um, I think what's much more meaningful when it comes to Simver are actual package versions, which is what it was designed for, like the you know, versioning libraries. So you can rationalize about the scope of changes that you're getting. Um, I'm not seeing your blog post. Like, it's not on your homepage yet. Should I just click on the blog? Not link? my homepage. Go to the yeah. blog. The homepage is... Handsome.com slash blog. I see. Uh, okay. The homepage takes a couple hours to cache. Ah, I got it. I got it. Which so, like should we... That live website. So, yeah, we did have... I mean, for people, there was some stuff discussed at the MVP Summit that isn't public. I mean, we shared an awful lot of stuff, but there was a pretty frank discussion about naming, um, which I know you'll recall because you were at the front of the room. Um, and you know we spoke about this with our uh, insiders and MVPs and you know valued community members at, at the summit. And I think the feedback was pretty universal that it would be great if we could have a different name. And this is what we came up with. So I, I'm hoping that this is um, that this uh, you know satisfies the people who were giving us that feedback, which it was which was pretty much most people. I don't think anyone really thought calling an ASP.NET 5 was a good idea. 
I would also encourage people to take a moment and breathe and read before they declare. Before they react. Because um, naming is hard. It is and very hard. Some people have said things like they would like, a, you know, they wanted they wanted a name like a like a, a, a noun. Who you know, yeah, silver, know. silver light, you know, something that was unique uh, and special. But I think they forget how hard it is to build a brand. Uh, you can't just throw out .NET or ASP.NET with the bathwater when you spend a decade and a half uh, building it, especially in enterprises. As easy yeah, absolutely. as absolutely, and let's call thing foo. And yeah, you know, we considered all the things that you would logically consider when um, talking about this. We put a deck again, you know, together internally. We took, you know, one of the biggest things for me was things like the Google Foo, as we call it. If I type this into a search engine, um, am I going to get back, you know, ten years of the wrong history, um, which was certainly a problem with some of the candidate names we had. Like at one point, we were talking about using Razor, like reappropriating the name Razor to mean this new thing instead of just the syntax right. of our review engine, and it was a cool name, but it had terrible Google foo, because how do you explain to people that we just changed what Razor meant, you know, five years after we launched it? Whereas if you type in ASP.NET space core, the first result right now is the new docs site, which talks about ASP.NET 5. So, yep. like, it's perfect. Like, we get, we get the top hit immediately just by choosing this name, and of course it lines up nicely with the work that we're doing in the .NET team as well, so... I think this is the best. I think this is. I think this is a good thing. So. It's a good, solid, ninety percent compromise. I think it makes it so ninety-nine percent of the problems. Yeah. yeah. Nothing's going to be perfect, but I think this is good. Never going to be perfect. Yeah. So how about we uh we turn through these questions? Mm -hmm. All right, let's do it, and then I got to go pick up the kids. Okay. All right, let's see what we got here. The new name sounds good. What about Perf? <laughs> What's new about Perf? So Perf is. Is we're Perf happy. Is also we, reset to one Perf is reset. Ten million requests per second. <laughs> uh, no, so we basically we've we've drawn the line underneath the benchmarking work for 1.0. Uh, Matthew, you know, we broke a million for plain text and blah blah blah. Um, there's still some work happening in MVC. We're making some slight adjustments to some of the types in tag helpers and things to reduce memory use because we want to make tag helpers be practically free to use for all intents and purposes. Um, but other than that, we're you know, and well, we're still looking at things like startup perf and deployment perf. We want you know, deploying in Azure to be nice and speedy, so we're still working through some of those issues right now. And we hope to have most of those fixed in the next week or two. Cool. Uh, is there a recommended hashtag for tweeting the Ooh. new name? I never thought about that. Because I, I, I always hashtag. Yeah, I've always hashtag. Core. I've always done ASP.NET five. So let's do it. Mm. Let's just coin it right now and say ASP.NET Core. I don't think we need a version number. No, I wouldn't put a version number. Um, right. So mm -hmm. I think we say I'm just going to say I'm going to put I'm just going to tweet ASP.NET Core. That's it. That's all I'm doing, and that I want that to be trending by the end of the stand-up. So. <laughs> all right. I doubt that will trend, but good luck. Uh, you know, you, you can't uh, always have what you want. Where is the Where can I get the cool new shirt Damien is wearing? I think that is a black T-shirt with a post-it note. That's a GitHub shirt <laughs> with the word "core" yeah. posted on. <laughs> that is the uh, that's the Tony Stark Iron Man GitHub shirt. That is, that is. It's I think it's called the the Octo the Arco Cat. Yeah, Octo Cat. Oct Octo. Well, because it's the Arc Reactor, so it's the Octo. Uh, Arco. Arco Cat. I think they call this one. Okay, oh, nice. that's uh, that is the most difficult thing for an Australian to say. <laughs> it is. Hey, hey, hey! I love the way that you can say at the beginning of every stand-up, you say "so," except it's like six syllables. Really? <laughs> so, so. Uh, where can we get the picture? What is the status of ADO.net and Core CRL? C C C L R. I mean, C L R. Or C L R. And allowing things other than E F. I am, okay, so I I am guessing what they're referring to is an extremely long issue on the CoreFX repo, with respects to the inability in the .NET Core ADO.NET APIs for doing what they call schema-based querying or returning like you know, querying the schema of a database. They removed all those APIs when they ported ADO.NET to .NET Core. Um, I, my understanding is they had proposed a, um, a new API 
to bring back most of that functionality, but that is something the .NET team is handling, not uh, the ASP.NET team. So you would be best to check the GitHub repo, um, the CoreFX repo, .NET slash CoreFX, to look at the status of that. But my understanding was they were proposing and implementing a new API to to add that missing uh, capability. But if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm sorry. Good, good answer. Even if you made it up, it, it's very believable. <laughs> Uh, justify the version 1.0. Yes. Is it aligned with net standard in some way? Uh, no. So net standard has its own versioning because net standard is a standard. Um, <laughs> that was very reductive of me. Um, so net standard will come out initially with five versions. It will start at 1.0, but one it's being retroactively versioned back to the beginning of when we did system runtime based PCLs which was all the way back with Windows 8 store apps. And so net standard 1.0 uh, basically means give me all the API that was available to a PCL, uh, most of it, um, when Windows 8 was released. Uh, net standard 1.5 will be the latest one, and that is basically equivalent to what DNX Core 50 was. Okay, That's the latest .NET Core cross-plat uh, API surface. That'll be net standard 1.5. So that is a different version number. The, this version number that we're talking about is an application platform version number. So like ASP.NET, you know, is it a platform and a framework and a whole bunch of stuff? Uh, Net standard is a little bit different, okay? Like that's more like the Java number. I think that the next, the next kind of clarity level will be writing contextual blog posts and documentation that calls out what, what net standard and .NET generations kind of means as a concept, but not. Yeah, and we, have, we do have a framing document about that, but it is fairly heavy reading. Um, like you have to really be committed. You can't just go in going, oh, I'm going to just learn about net standard and think it's going to be light. Like it defines a whole bunch of new terms that you may not be familiar with. It talks about history. It talks about how these things work. It talks about how they're implemented. Um, so that document exists, and but it will take probably most people quite a few readings to really grok it. And we don't have the tooling in place yet to sort of support that. And so... I think that'll get much clearer as VS updates for RC2 and RTM, and we start seeing these things sort of leak more into how we do our development. Shiny, shiny. What's the timeline for SignalR on .NET, on ASP.NET Core? Um, post RTM, so frankly, I don't care. Sorry. Uh, the moment I care about RTM, it'll be sometime when after six. RTM. When yeah. Doom Honestly, I'm not going to make any promises about stuff post RTM because. Yeah, well, I think the point that's is what we're that focused on right now. I think the thing is that people like SignalR. They do, they and so you can build SignalR yourself from the repo right now and use it just fine. Uh, the new SignalR on, under ASP.NET. So that it still builds. We make sure it builds. We haven't just abandoned it. Um, it, it builds. We're just not shipping it because we don't have time to make all the changes we want to for to make an RTM. Now here's a great comment from Nick Craver from Stack Overflow, and I would point out that uh, John Skeet. Yep. Did, you, did you hang out with him last week? I saw him and we spent no, time. No, I didn't even see him last week, actually. Okay. John and I are besties, uh, and uh, we spent time together in London, and he said the exact same thing Nick is saying here, and I think that it's an interesting thing and worth pointing yep. out. Will there be additional RCs added to the timeline? There's a lot of cheese moving. Pretty abnormal for an RC. I think one additional RC, that's what John Skeet suggested. Uh, even if it's just in the middle, just to say I heard the feedback and here's another another release between so, RC2 and release would be useful. Again, not an original idea. It's a completely logical idea, right? <gasps> the problem is, in order for that to work, you need to invent some time. So we, we cannot do that and ship the RTM when we're currently slated to ship it. It's just not There's possible. There is literally no time in the world. There is literally no time to do that if we're going to hit our RTM commitment. The mm. only way that can happen is if we slip RTM, and that's currently not on the table. And I so I, I think most developers can understand that. It's like, you know, you have this, you have N weeks. At the end of this, you are shipping RTM. Can you put in an RC in the middle of this? Well, no, there is overhead in putting out a new release. And right. if we do that, we will not have enough time to ship RTM when and we if have you to. If you make a phony one, if you ship, like, you know, RC2 on Monday and RC3 yeah. on Friday, then nothing What have you will achieved? Do. Exactly. So I totally hear you. Um, I would love nothing more than to have another two months and to put a, another RC out so we had a, another RC to bake this change rather than just the one. But as you know, I will be told from higher up, yeah, guys, you've got to ship sometime. And mm. so <laughs> this is at the moment the plan is we're, you know, we're going to have one more RC, which will be RC2, which will be in February, and then we will ship RTM 
at the end of March. All right. Um, I am going to have to go get my kids. Can okay. you finish up here, John? Uh, sure. So yeah, you, although the one thing is I can't mark answers and stuff like that. Can you see them and scroll around at least? I can yeah, see them and scroll around. Yeah, right. we'll, we'll do So I'm going to cool. disappear, and then I will push stop broadcast and then trim the broadcast when I get back, okay? Cool. Can you dramatic zoom out? I will dramatically zoom myself out. <laughs> And uh, and then I'm going to hide myself, but the thing will keep running. You just okay. Uh, here we go. It's dramatic. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm pitching a new project to a client, deciding between PHP and .NET. If we are starting something from scratch, would you suggest .NET Core? Um, I would suggest that you look at NetCore and see if it meets the requirements for your project, if it's a good fit. I'm not going to try and... I, I've said this before. I, I'm not going to try and sell you, um, you know, ASP.NET Core over Node or PHP or anything else. So I'm going to say, this is what we have. This are the things that we believe in. This is what we do. Take a look at it for yourself. And if you think it's a good fit, uh, use it. I'd encourage you to have a look. Uh, feedback from Nick. Uh, for what it's worth, everyone I've talked to outside Microsoft would rather see RTM slip in exchange for one over being more complete. Uh, that doesn't surprise me, especially with core libraries that are blocked, uh, locked in with interfaces and such and cannot be fixed post RTM. Uh, yeah, I totally hear you, Nick. Um, doesn't change anything about what I said before, but I totally hear you and uh, that is perfectly reasonable feedback to give. Um, just a comment. I think it's great. It gives clarity. This is from Sebastian. Mm -hmm. uh, it shows the team to be honest, engaged, and aware of the community. Well done. It's a brand new world. Will EF follow? Yes, EF will follow. The blog post talks about that. EF will become Entity Framework Core version 1, which will live separately to Entity Framework, um, you know, the existing product, uh, which continues to be supported and you know, will get fixes and things uh, as other things do. Will ASP.NET Core version ever diverge from the MVC version and or EF version? I honestly don't know. Too early to say. I don't have a crystal ball. We haven't made. We haven't really thought beyond um, RTM. I can see a future where it does, and I can see a future where it doesn't. So, don't know. It's um, kind of, I, I mean, it's very nice to have converged <laughs> at, at this point because people get so confused. Oh, with of course, like, now, ASP. but, you know, I, I'm not sure over time, as we add more things, yeah, like I, I don't know. It just you know, just like we added SignalR, you know, many years after we did other things, and we didn't roll that in, right? I mean, right. Yeah, there, there are some nice things in saying, uh, let's version everything together, uh, but it adds overhead to every release. Like the releases just get bigger and bigger and bigger. So not sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish I had a good question to ask right now. It is 2 a.m., so my brain is dead. Well, that's unfortunate, uh, uh, Stephen. I hope you come back from that. Uh, but I'm basically just saying that they love uh, what is it? Love all the work you've done. The changes you guys are great. Keep doing. Oh, I can read comments like that all day. Thanks, mate. Uh, <laughs> great. Uh, <laughs> so yes, any framework. Someone answering the other one. Yep. Any framework seven is now EF core. Yep. Loads of folks on Twitter asking if EF will follow. Yep. So we've answered that. Any plans to support another localization data source? Uh, you mean I I I believe it, Hasham means. Are we going to ship another one? Like you can write whatever localization source you want and plug mm -hmm. it in behind the new APIs. That is the whole point of those APIs. Um, but uh, right now, I think the one that we've talked about is supporting PO files. Uh, PO files are what was done on GNU, and they support a whole bunch of localization features that the resource manager in .NET does not. Um, so I can certainly see a future where we do that and we add new API, like an I pluralized string localizer, for example, um, that wouldn't be able to be backed by a resource manager. So we'd have to use a different file format and a different tool chain, all that type of stuff. That's a fairly substantial work item, so it's not going to happen anytime soon, but I think it will happen one day. Um, what's the thinking on items like system directory services being available on core CLR, even if it's only on Windows or a more generic LDAP library? Yeah, LDAP comes up quite a lot, actually, and I use it as an example of something that's currently not there. Uh, this is that. Uh, this one's a decent blocker on some apps. Yeah, uh, good question, Nick. I would, if you haven't already, I I would uh, log that on the Core FX repo, because uh, obviously they own the uh, everything at System.star. 
Um, LDAP is an industry standard, so um, I think it's certainly a great candidate for having a you know a .NET uh, you know, a library that we support. And we have prior art with System Directory Services. Although my understanding is System Directory Services is a little more skewed towards the Active Directory side of things than it is the LDAP side of things. I mean, Active Directory is somewhat LDAP compliant, but I think there's APIs and things in there that are somewhat specific to Windows. But obviously, as Nick says, uh, that would be useful. But thus far, we don't have too many Windows-specific APIs in .NET Core. Uh, for the most part, they're pretty cross-platform in their nature. So, But that's certainly something that I've heard, and we should probably, if it's not already, get that discussion up uh, on the core FX repo, so we can plan for that in the uh, in the long run. Uh, so, Damien, keep up the good work, enjoying the fruit mince pies. <laughs> yeah, love my fruit mince pies. Uh, what is the new naming for MVC? Well, really, the MVC is just a subsystem of ASP.NET, and so the package will be Microsoft ASP.NET Core, Microsoft dot ASP.NET Core, one word dot MVC. Um, the official product name is, you know, I don't know. Like, does it even have an official product name? It's just MVC. You know, ASP.NET Core MVC, um, rather than MVC Core, which is something else, which is like the core package of the MVC packages themselves, which is a little different. Uh, what else? The, the Net Core is getting is someone's linking to a blog post, so I'm not quite sure what that's about. Um, any good way to inject content of file, embedded file inside Razor? Uh, there's not a first-class way to inject the content of a file into the source of a Razor file. Um, it depends on whether you're talking about during compilation of the Razor file or during runtime. Um, either way, there isn't really a first-class way of doing that, other than just you know using a you know, file dot read all lines and emitting that out. Mm -hmm. If that's what you want to do, that's probably the easiest way to do that. Um, or you could write a tag helper to do it, which would be pretty straightforward as well. Um, of course, as we scroll down, other ones bubble to the top because as people vote for them, they go to the top. So I have to keep jumping back up to the top to see if anything has changed. Uh, is uh, Microsoft ASP.NET Node Services shipping with ASP.NET Core 1.0? No. That, the current plan is for the Node Services and the Angular uh, Services and React Services packages to ship as a beta uh, when we ship ASP.NET Core uh, RTM. Uh, they will not be ready in time. Uh, to RTM at the same time, so we'll ship them as a beta in that same time frame. Uh, da, 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 scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Finding a new one, finding a new one. Let's have a look. Is there a way to gracefully support green blue deployment strategy? Specifically, new app B starts, warms up, but does not bind to the port until old app A unbinds this port and yields request execution, but does not necessarily terminate in case of rollback. Kind of uh, like sl slots in app service. Well, slots in app well, service are not, are not hot swap. So, yeah, yeah, um, right. uh, whereas VIPs are hot swap in yeah. cloud services. So uh, the thing that is, uh, it, this is possible. So when your configure method is called in the startup class, your app doesn't actually start listening on the port until the configure method returns. Because in the configure method, you still have a chance to, uh, to set up the web server. And so you could conceivably um, build a helper API that you call from your configure method that coordinates a rolled um, deployment like that. Now, that is absolutely something that you could do. Um, obviously, you need a way to coordinate this. It'd probably be a file on disk or something. So the old app, the old deployment that's rolling down would probably write to a file to indicate to the new app that it's now time to switch over or something like that. And you would block the call to the configure method or the return from the configure method, I should say, um, on that file or whatever semaphore you, you choose to use um, from being tripped. So yeah, totally possible. And that's probably the place I would look to hooking that in is delaying the return of the configure method until such time that you want the new app um, to start listening to requests. Um, I would like to run a custom deploy tool after I publish to the file system. Um, you can now do post publish. So in Project JSON, as part of RC2, you'll be able to run a script after publish has completed. We just checked in that support last week. In fact, we'll be using that ourselves to support um, the transformation of the web.config file that we have to do to configure IIS for the HTTP platform handler. 
And so you'll be able to add a post-publish stage in your scripts section and run whatever tool that you want to run. So hopefully that uh, solves that problem for you. Uh, can you give me any guidance on how to resolve dependency issues when including a classic CS proj libraries in the new ASP.NET Core project files? I'm getting errors like the following net platform 54 error, dependency next, or blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's not particularly fantastic right now. That will get better in RC2, OK? Um, the way that we do XProj or project JSON referencing to CS projects right now is with a utility called Wrap, which really just wraps around um, the emitted DLL from your CS project, which means you have to kind of coordinate the build yourself. That is all being uh, re-implemented for RC2 uh, in a much more first-class way. Now that we're replatting on, on the .NET Core CLI, uh, that work is actually being done in CS Proj itself. So you'll be able to reference, you know, CS Proj will be able to reference XProj and vice versa, and they will work a lot better. So um, I would hold um, hold off. Uh, until RC2 for that to get uh, demonstrably better. Uh, do you think that going for RC was a bit early, considering the changes that happened code-wise and name-wise? Um, it's a fair question. Um, unfortunately, it was just the way kind of the, the, the balls landed on the ground at that time. We had a bunch of stuff in the air. We'd already committed to shipping an RC1. Uh, and when I say committed, that means various things. Um, both events and customers and internal commitments, all types of stuff. Um, and after that was done, the decision to replat on top of the .NET Core CLI, when that change was decided on, uh, happened after that. And so it was decided that this was the sort of the, the best approach we could take, given all the inputs that we had. Uh, in an ideal world, we would not have done it that way. In an ideal world, we would do many things differently. But we don't live in an ideal world, and unfortunately, things don't always happen in the order that we want. And you know, while you, it's easy to say, well, if they don't happen in that order, you should just take longer, that always isn't a, the most palatable option to everyone that's involved either. And so um, I, in the ideal world, I'd be able to say, yeah, we'll just, let's just take more time. Oh, this change came in late. Let's just postpone mm -hmm. it for two months. We can't do that forever, unfortunately. Sometimes we just have to make a call and, and do something and get through a, 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 bumpy, a bumpy patch. Right? Well, sometimes um, things are messy. And like you said, you got to ship sometime, and there's some yeah. things that you know, like the feedback and the and the changes you'll make as you're in RC phase or pre-release are different than the feedback you'll get once you're actually shipped. You know, and yep. people are using things in production, and you start getting more enterprise feedback and more all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I mean, it's important to remember, like different customers look at the product in different ways, and a lot of customers will completely disregard the RC from that point of view, but we'll look at it more as a you know true stabilization. And I can see why they would be uh, concerned that we're making changes of this magnitude post the first RC. And I don't have a great answer for you other than what we've already said. That's just the way things lined up. And um, that's the reality of where we are. Hopefully, we'll look back post RTM. And we'll just go, yep, it wasn't the most smooth birth. But we got there in the end, and the end result is good. And so we can all just go, yeah, well, you know, if we'd had our time over, we might have done it differently with a bit of, you know, 2020 hindsight. But this is what this is what we did. So I saw one other thing, kind of, you know, like you said, the list pops around. Uh, Hisham asked uh, another question. He said, any plans to use tag helpers in web pages in non-MVC web apps? I'm not uh, really sure. We have ideas. Plans is a strong word. But we certainly, we talked about this at the MVP Summit. There's a talk about mm. what a potential web pages replacement might look like. And not only that, but like debating whether we should even do it. Um, so we even like revisited what are the advantages and sort of tenets of doing a framework like that uh, that is different to MVC. And what type of thing, you know, what, what type of programming model, what, you know, how could we really, if we were going to do this, what could we really do if we were going to change a bunch of things? And so. I would encourage people to, to look at that talk because I think we discussed some interesting points in there. I, I Personally, my feeling right now is that I think there's enough interest there that we should definitely consider it at some point. Um, but I couldn't say for sure uh, how that will land or when or what shape it will take, all that type of thing. I think we could do some really interesting things there. But there's a, a, a good portion of customers who also look at that and go, well, isn't everything just moving to the client now? Why would we invest in a whole new server-based you know, page rendering paradigm when there's a whole bunch of problems to be solved over in the spa land. So I mean, that's a valid point as well. But 
you know, it's not, I don't think there's one solution that fits all needs. It's never that way in software and there'll always be applications that are very spar and client focused and there'll be those that are uh, just server rendered and, and could, could benefit from a very server rendered focused um, sort of web pages framework. So, yeah, but certainly tag helpers would be part of that. It would be razor based and tag helpers would be a big part of that. We saw some other questions. I don't know if you want to cut it off at some point, but a, a few questions pop to the top here. There's okay. one. Uh, there's one that says, um, "Let me see." Now they're moving around on me. Um, I remember when ASP.NET started including jQuery because, as Hanselman puts it, jQuery won. It is. Yeah. Yep. So it says, "Is ASP.NET writing on Angular and React from now on?" Uh, I don't think that's as clear cut as jQuery was. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, you know, jQuery got to a point where it was used on the majority of websites, like on the top 100. Um, Angular and React are nowhere near that. Um, right. So I think they're a lot more, I think they will be somewhat more niche for a while. I, I think they fill um, and suit a certain type of application uh, very, very well. And I'm, I, I could see a future where we have a template that definitely, I mean, we're building uh, the Angular services and React services. Um, extensions in you know as a direct sort of reaction to people using those frameworks in ASP.NET apps and us looking and going well how can we add value there what can we do to really utilize the power of server-side rendering and .NET to augment uh, you know that sort of client focused development so I think we can add value there um, I don't think just slapping more client frameworks in the box is the right thing to do I, I, it, it, we, we tried that we had a spa yeah. app we had a spa template it was very ill thought out and really didn't solve anything for anybody. Um, and so I think um, I think if we were to do that, it would be part of a much more curated experience where we didn't just, oh, here's a spa template with the, you know, with, the, with Angular whatever and whatever. Like, have fun, you know, go and learn about that in your own time. It would, if we were going to do that, it would be something a lot more coordinated um, and, like I said, a lot more focused. Um, but I, yeah, but we are doing, we are certainly investing in Angular and React with the node services integration work that Steve is working on um, because I think we can add real value there. And you know, the work we're doing there actually um, isn't just for ASP.NET, like we're actually affecting change in those frameworks and hopefully setting some standards that will work for all. You know, we'll help server-based frameworks work well with client-based frameworks like moving forward. So. A couple other questions about, uh, well, here's a question from Peter. He says, should we expect ASP.NET Core 2 this year? Will the cadence increase? No, I don't think so. At okay. the moment, um, I think uh, this year will be obviously ASP.NET Core 1, and then we'll see you know, uh, servicing releases and feature releases after that. So expect to see minor releases. Like I think you'll see feature releases. You'll see 1.1s and 1.2s, or you'll see Signal R, and you know, it depends where we focus the resources next. Um, I think there's, there's a bunch of stuff on the backlog that I'd love to get to. It's all going to come down to prioritization. Um, okay. But certainly, we don't, don't expect a big 2.0 release this year. So uh, <laughs> Chad asks, you know, based on the name thing, he says, what happens four plus versions later when we have ASP.NET MVC 5 and ASP.NET Core MVC 5? I'll worry about that five versions from now. <laughs> all right. I mean, frankly, I, I, because that's, I, I don't... That's a while. Don't think, that's years separated, too. Yeah, I, I don't think we're going to... Uh, personally, right now, today, I don't think we're going to be in a situation... I'm not viewing this as, like, we're going to do a major release every year and break the world. Like, if people want us to do Semver, I would like us to do Semver, and we won't do a major release unless we're going to break stuff. Mm. Um, we can do additive releases, and everything's in packages now, so we can just release new packages, like different packages, that add new features that don't necessarily rewrite the core. Um, so, yeah, the, the need for doing a major version, I think, is reduced now with this change. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, here's a question from Jason, uh, and he, he says, I've heard the following. If you run the application pool using the application pool identity, you have to make sure that IIS iUsers has access to your publish folder. Is this yeah, true it's because it's not in the docs? Um, it is true that if you're running on IIS, you must consider a great many things. <laughs> <laughs> and that is one of them. Um, application pool identities and the identity you run your app pool as is a very personal decision. Uh, it all depends on your environment. The default, as it has been for some now, is this magical app pool identity, which is kind of generated on the fly, which can be a little difficult to work with. 
And mm -hmm. yeah, it, it needs to have access to any file that has to get loaded by the process. And so that includes all the DLLs that are in your packages, which ergo means the packages folder, which if you've published, is the publish folder, you know, is the output of your project. So, yes. We have some docs on setting up IIS. We do. We have a full doc now on doing that, I believe. Yeah. So, um, yep. Um, let me see. One more question from Nick, and then we got to cut Nick off here. And then we got to... Yeah. <laughs> he says, uh, are there any plans to bring more tooling in-house for MVC 6 or 1 or whatever? He says, to reduce the Node.js dependency and impact on dev workflow, i.e. eliminating the 98% case of touching NPM from any developers. So I think he's talking about, like, uh, Grunt, Gulp, NPM. Yeah. So, that I mean, that's been talked about. Uh, the biggest problem there is every time we deviate from what the wider web community is doing, mm -hmm. we, we drive a wedge in some way between, well, this is the way .NET does it, and this is the way the rest of the world does it. So, I mean, that was one of the big reasons behind, you know, adopting things like Bower and NPM and Grunt and Gulp was that that's what we saw the majority of the community doing. Now, I understand that some people are uneasy about that, and there is a learning curve associated with that. I know that we did have some ideas around at least for, as Nick points out, the very common cases, wouldn't it be nice if we had a very simple tool um, that uh, covered those cases without you having to necessarily learn a whole new ecosystem? Um, I don't have any firm plans on what that would look like or where that would land. Um, I have to sync up with those folks again. Um, but that's a, it, it, that is a tricky problem. It really is. And, like, I... Because, uh, you know, frankly, I don't think us going off and building our own .NET-based ecosystem, um, especially one that we built um, and tried to drive into the world and force down everyone's throats, is necessarily the right thing to do there. I know some people want us to do that. Um, I don't think that means it's the right thing to do. Um, there are advantages in you know, utilizing what the community has already built in the wider web development community. Uh, even if that means our customers have to learn some uh, some new some new things, um, but I do think I, I, on, this, on the other side of the coin, though, is I don't think that means that we necessarily get out of jail free. Like I think we have to put the work in to make sure that using those things is the best possible experience that it can be when you buy into our stack. And if that means we have to you know build new tasks or build new tools or um, you know et cetera et cetera, then I think we should we should do that. And I don't think we've done the best job of that to date, but I, you know, I think some of the things we've done in VS, like the Task Runner Explorer, um, uh, you know, give, gives you an idea to some of the thinking uh, around that. So that's a tricky one. That's a really tricky one. I think that's all the questions. Okay. Is Scott actually back? Are you actually back, Scott? So not only am I back, but I've realized the value that I provide to the community stand-up is, is shutting you up. <laughs> You're still going. I went all the way to my kid's school, picked them both up, and then came home in a leisurely speed. Hey, people keep asking questions. People yeah. love it. So, so really, the value you provide is you close the questions. When oh, okay, I clicked we that. We can do that. <laughs> um, did we, uh, do you think we followed them all? Uh, yeah, we did. Probably good enough. Yeah, we've, we've probably gone long enough. Brilliant. Brilliant. I like it. Well, well, congratulations and kudos to you for answering them all. So I'm um, yeah, and kudos to uh, to you. Uh, we this naming thing has been a slog. We've worked hard to get this through, and you and I have been working on this for a few months now. And um, it's harder than you think to get several hundred people to agree on something. Yes. Yeah, I feel like, I feel a sense of achievement. So it's a lot. I mean, I just you know, we're not hiding anything, but I just wish people would understand how complicated this stuff is. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I, I like to think that, you know, the, the fact that we do this every week at least gives some people, um, hopefully gives people an insight into how we try and work through these things and that we do think about these things. Nothing we do here is, you know, we're not trying to be flippant. Like, we think about a lot of these things and talk about them very hard, and none of them are easy. No matter what decision we come up with, we're going to piss someone off. That's just, that's just the reality of the world. So we try and pick the one that makes most people happy. <laughs> well, yeah. All right. Bye. Brilliant. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, John, for just loving community so much. Uh, 
if you do have yes, if you do have uh, community links, of course, send them to John. If you got a great blog post you want spotlighted on the ASP.NET site, that's part of John's job. So uh, feel free to send me or John spotlighted items or great blog posts, and we'll make sure that the people uh, people see them. Cool. Sweet. Bye, everybody. Oh, zoom out. We're doing, we're doing, hang on. Let's do a dual simultaneous dual zoom, out. zoom out with with switching. So you should push your chair back. You are so zoomed in because your camera is so much closer. Yeah, I know. So that's that's all I got to do. So okay. this is my hey, selfie. John, I thought here. John was. John, are you going to zoom out as well? This is. Oh, I was zooming in, but I could zoom out. Sure. Oh, digital zoom out's not quite nearly as cool. Uh, it's pretty good. Can we actually show like side by side? Will people see this at the same time in the video? It's a very flattering <laughs> angle. <laughs> <laughs> is that the Connery? That's nice. Uh -huh. Hello. Hello. Today, Mr. comrades, we sail into history. <laughs> Scottish Russian submarine captain accent. All right, your turn, Jamie. <laughs> oh God.